Welcome to this afternoon session on uh, how to run uh, taxonomic profilers, or actually we're only going to look at one, and how to deal with the data and to do a um, bit of microbial ecology. Um, so actually, if you go uh, in your instance uh, or the server, I'll close what I was doing this morning, conductivate or Python. Up and all right. Got a command that you run, and you should be here. And then we just uh, run a Jupyter notebook. It will open the browser tab with the Jupyter environment. Okay, so we'll wait uh, just a few seconds for everyone to have this uh, opened. And uh, that's the one you should see. Uh, different screen. Okay. So if everyone is stuck, please leave a message in the in the chat, and uh, Alex uh, or James can maybe assist you. Uh, otherwise, we'll uh, we'll proceed, but we'll go slow at the beginning anyway. So for uh, those of you who never used um, uh, Jupyter, uh, this is the so-called uh, Jupyter Notebook interface. Uh, if you did the the Python session this morning, you kind of played with it, but if you didn't, don't worry; it's uh, not really complicated. Uh, we basically have the, the list of all the files that are uh, that we're going to use uh, for this tutorial. And uh, maybe what we're going to start with um, is actually uh, a small, um, small quiz um, to get to know you a bit better. Um, and we're, I'm just going to unlock the first question. Publish, question, publish, yes. So if you go to this uh, URL, partyc.fi uh, uh, slash 9786192, uh, the first question, and just also to make sure that this is working for you, is how familiar are you with Pass and Pandas? So I apologize for those of you who did the, the question this morning, but hopefully now you can score a bit higher than uh, when you answered this morning. Oh, sorry, yeah, part of the line. Okay, so the answers are increasing. So um, hopefully you can see that there are a lot of people who are uh, not super familiar with Python. Uh, so if you feel that you're stuck at some point uh, or that you don't really get it, feel free to ask a question. You can see the, the mode of this distribution. Most of the people actually uh, only consider themselves to be slightly familiar with Python or even sometimes not at all. So don't feel stupid to ask a question, go for it. Uh, this is the, the point of this um, uh, summer school. So don't hesitate to unmute yourself or to ask the question in the chat. OK, so the, the, the data sets that uh, we're going to work with um, today, um, I'm going to introduce it in uh, one of the first notebooks. So you can click in the notebook directory, uh, notebook, and then in the on the download at some sample uh, notebook. And we're not going to do anything with this notebook. It's just to uh, show you um, what I used to um, um, pre-process the data, to prepare it for the summer school. And when this opens, it says kernel not found, you can choose on uh, Python, conda, or Python. 
and you click on set kernel. All right. Um, so the data set that uh, we're going to use today is coming from a paper that was published uh, last year. And actually, I've been told that we have one of the co-authors of this paper uh, attending the summer school. Um, and we're going to use one sample of this data set. Um, so it's a very nice study, actually. I really like um, enjoyed reading this study, uh, where they look at the coprolites uh, or the, the paleophysis uh, coming from um, from a mine, uh, I believe this one is in uh, in Austria, if I'm not mistaken. And they look at a time series of the different coprolites across different levels of the mine. Uh, so you can see, yeah, this is in Austria. And you can see the mine uh, with the different levels from, and coprolites were associated to different time periods from the Bronze Age, the Early Iron Age, and the Baroque period. So what the coprolite look like? And the one that we're going to work with is actually uh, one library of the 2612 uh, sample, which dates to the modern, uh, the relatively modern time. Um, so around in the 18th uh, century. And we're going to use uh, one sequencing library only because this sample was actually sequenced very deeply. So the methods are not restricted uh, on the size, but because we want to make it uh, running relatively quickly for the summer school, uh, we actually work with a smaller data set that I even uh, further downsampled. And this is important to keep in mind uh, because it will have some effects on our results. But you wouldn't do this um, when you're working in the real life with a real sample. But the methods and the comments are otherwise exactly the same. It's just the point uh, for the, the point of having something run relatively fast. And in this paper, the uh, they're, they hypothesized that they actually found a blue cheese based on uh, on the bacterial and the yeast community that they found in these paleophysis. So I found it all uh, very very nice, and the whole analysts are also very nice in this paper that uh, they can they could identify it and reconstruct part of the the food intake of this person before producing this beautiful piece of um, excrement. All right, and as I was saying, I just. Uh, downsample it to 1 million reads so that I could upload them to the service I'm using uh, for sharing the data with you. Uh, yeah. So now we can go back uh, to the previous page. I'm back on Jupyter, go to notebooks. And now the notebook that we're interested in is the analysis uh, notebook. And that's the one that we're going to work with today. All right. Um, so in this tutorial, we're going to, first of all, generate a taxonomic profile with uh, Metaflan version 3. We're going to have a look at the Metaflan results um, with uh, Pavian um, and also generate a Krona plot. Um, we're going to compare the diversity of our samples um, versus the diversity of modern gut samples. And we're going to look at different microbiology ecology metrics. And uh, this will imply looking at the composition of our sample uh, versus the modern gold sample. And then we can really see where they fit in a lower dimensional space. Uh, so for the people who never work in the Jupyter notebook, um, we'll just give a quick intro to, to what you're looking at. So Jupyter notebook is the bit equivalent if you're more familiar with, um, with R Markdown to the R Markdown documents except that we're not working in a single text file. We're working with the concept of cells. So everything is a cell uh, in a Jupyter notebook. You can click on a cell. It will select it. And in the case of this cell, this text cell, you can double click on it to edit it. And you can see that behind it is actually markdown uh, content. And to execute it, you can either uh, select the cell, have it open with the little blinking cursor, and click on Run. Or uh, if you're lazy like me, uh, you quickly uh, get to use the keyboard shortcuts, which is Control Enter. So you press Control Enter. It's also executing the cell. Uh, so this is a markdown cell, for example, I was just saying, as the one above. This is a Python cell, so executing some Python code, which is the language that we're going to use for this tutorial. But 
uh, using different packages, you can also run most of the same analysis in R. I think, I believe the packages in R to run this are ape, vegan, and phyloseq. So we can execute a Python cell the same way, uh, control enter. We can also run some bash code uh, to run a single line bash code. We prepend the line with this exclamation mark. And here I just say echo, this is a how to run a single uh, line bash command. And finally, we can also run uh, multi-line bash codes by having this uh, so-called Jupyter magic commands with the percentage percentage batch. And then we can have as many lines of bash as we want. And then we execute it again with control enter. And it displays us uh, the message of this um, uh, code. Um, last, Last bits of uh, interesting thing to know, basic interesting thing to know for us in Jupyter is to uh, insert a cell above or uh, below the current one. And if you just have a cell but are not editing it, uh, for example, right now, um, when you edit a cell, it's green. When you're just selecting a cell without editing it, it's uh, blue, the light blue on the left. And to when you're in just this uh, cell selecting mode, you type B it will insert a new cell below, or if you type A, it will insert a new cell above. So I can do it again. And to delete a cell, I can select a cell and click on X. It's actually not deleting it, it's cutting it away. So here above with A, below with B. All right. Congratulations, if you've never heard of Jupyter before, you can almost already use all the complicated functionalities. All right, um, so I was talking about data pre-processing uh, before uh, to prepare the data um, for this uh, tutorial. And the way I did that uh, was first uh, after, um, was first pre-processing it with a pipeline called NFCore Eager, which I believe James introduced you earlier this week. Uh, I use a function of NFCore Eager uh, which is called the host removal, uh, host input removal, which basically removes uh, the DNA of the genome you align it to. And in this case, I aligned it against uh, the human genome. So I basically remove all the human DNA uh, that you have in your sample. And this is a common pre-processing step that allows you to have less mispapping uh, reads that could align to the uh, human, but that would align to your bacteria. It speeds up the computation at the end because you have a lot less reads to deal with. And also, if you have modern contamination from uh, the experimentator, it removes at least the one that uh, aligned to the human. And last but not least, usually when you publish a study of microbiome, depending on the ethical agreement that you have, but usually you're not allowed to publish the human reads if you work with more modern population. Even with ancient population, sometimes it depends on what kind of ethical agreement you have. So the first thing that we're going to do um, is actually do like uh, this morning for those of you attending the Jupiter session, we're going to get rid of all the work that was done already because uh, we are very adventurous. So there is no coming back. So we click on all output and clear. Now we have no results whatsoever. Okay. So in... Um, in any, uh, uh, every time you work with uh, sequencing data, one of the first things that you need to do is to remove the low quality sequence and the, adapt the sequencing adapters. And there are many different programs to do that. Currently in Eager, for example, they use uh, one program called Adapter Removal. Uh, one that I like a bit, a bit more is called FastP. It's doing exactly the same. It's just a bit nicer to use. Uh, from the user perspective, it's called uh, FASTP. Um, and as we can run bash in Jupyter, we can just prepend the line with the exclamation mark and look at the help of FASTP. Uh, so this will open and you can actually scroll, um, scroll through. If this is uh, it's open on the whole page, you can right click, uh, no, not right click, click on view and says uh, cell toolbar. Print output. Uh, yeah, you click on all output and toggle uh, 
scrolling. So it will uh, allow you to scroll through the, the output. So I can not scroll in it. Uh, so we see that uh, we have a bunch of values, a bunch of uh, options, sorry, for FASTP, but the most basic one is uh, I for the uh, input file, O for the output file, capital I for the second output file because we're working with paired and sequencing data, and capital O for the second output file uh, because, again, uh, we're working with paired and sequencing data. There are a bunch of options, especially uh, for ancient DNA, as you saw probably earlier in the lecture about eager or about um, the introduction to um, ancient uh, DNA processing. We'll merge our reads and because we have very short sequencing data, so we want to use the dash M or dash dash merge option. Come on, give me the, yes. And, uh, and that's pretty much it. Uh, Yes. So this is the FASTP command that we have at the end. Uh, to And the, this backla backslash is just here to make sure that we, uh, instead of having one single line where we have to scroll uh, forever, we can actually break up the line in multiple different ones, just adding a backslash every, one to, every time we want to break up the line. But this is interpreted in one single long line. So the first is the forward read uh, for FWD, and actually there is a mistake here. Oops. Uh, the reverse file, and that's it. So we can execute it. Control Enter. This should be relatively quick. FASP is relatively quick. It's running. It, and in red, we have the output uh, of uh, FASP. So the, the message, the log file of uh, FASP. So it tells us that we had uh, this much read, this much basis with good quality, uh, how many reads were filtered, uh, what's the duplication rate, and et cetera. So yeah, you can look at it. Uh, all of this is, if you weren't eager, usually uh, you have it in the multi-QC uh, output, not for FASTP, but for uh, multi-QC. All right, so now we have trimmed our reads. Uh, we can actually start to do metagenomics. So the profiler that we're going to use today is uh, Metaflon3 that Tina introduced this morning. Metaflon3 is very nice because, first of all, it was one of the first profilers uh, to be used for uh, studying human, um, human microbiomes. The big human microbiome project, I'm talking about modern microbiome, was done with Metaflon, uh, Metaflon um, version 1 at the, at the time in 2000. 12, if I think, if I remember correctly. Uh, and now it's the third iteration of Metaflan. And we're going to use it because it's relatively fast to run. And also, um, the, the always <laughs> for those of you who aren't there, there is a, a really weird AC system here. Um, and the third iteration of Metaflan um, is used by another package that we're going to um, make use of the results uh, of. So we can easily compare the Metaflan result that we're going to generate with the pre-processed Metaflan results from another library that we're going to talk about in a minute. So as always, we can look at the help message of Metaflan. Uh, and it's quite extensive. There is also the website of Metaflan. Uh, that you can look at, but the help message usually is enough. Uh, it gives us even an example on how to run Metaflan. Uh, and we can look at it. So Metaflan, we have to give our uh, FASTQ file, uh, and we can have a bunch of options. The one comment that we're going to use today is this one. So we say Metaflan. Uh, this is, we give it our uh, merge FASTQ file from uh, just before that we process with uh, uh, FASTP. We specify that it's a FASTQ input. Uh, Metaflan is actually running an aligner in the background called botai2. So we tell to Metaflan to give us the botai2 output here in this file. We give it four CPUs, and we write the results uh, to this file, uh, metaflanprofile.txt. And I've already pre-processed this for um, all of you, because uh, Metaflan needs to download a database in the background. And if we all download the database at the same time, uh, it wouldn't be very nice for their server. So you already have the results of Metaflan um, available on your machines. 
Um, but it's if you want to run it yourself, you just type the command, but please don't do it all at the same time. Otherwise, in Italy, there, uh, where they, their server is hosted, they're not going to like us very much. OK, so uh, we can have a look at, actually, the, um, the, the very beginning of this file. Uh, again, a bash command. Uh, we look at head of uh, this file. And we can see that this is a tab separated file uh, that starts with a bunch of line with this uh, pound sign or this hash sign and that we'll have to deal with. It tells us uh, it's using the database version, uh, version 30 of Chocoflan. Chocoflan is the name of this database and it's from 2019. It tells us which command we used, and uh, then it uh, tells us um, like the column names. All right. So one way to explore this uh, this taxonomic profile is actually to visualize it with uh, Pavian. Uh, so Pavian is an interactive app. Uh, it's actually if if you are familiar with uh, R Shiny, it's a Shiny app. Um, and you have different ways to run it. Uh, you can either, if you have Docker installed of your system, uh, which I don't think you have, um, you can uh, run it. But for the future, this is the way I would recommend you uh, to run um, to run Pavian. Uh, otherwise, if you're uh, working directly in R, you can directly run it from R. But we're not going to open uh, an R session right now. But just to uh, emphasize that uh, usually in bioinformatics, you don't need to be bilingual, but knowing other languages is helping uh, quite a bit because not every packages are available in every language. This is true for both R and for both Python. And the last option that we're going to try today is, um, is to look, to click on this link, which is the, um, the sorry, the Pavian uh, application hosted on the Shiny Apps server. And actually, this link I haven't visited in a while, so let's see if it's still working. Yes, great. So you should arrive here. Um, let's see if it supports 30 per turn in parallel. Hopefully, yes. Uh, and you click on Browse, and uh, you go in. Uh, where am I going to find it here? Home. So you click on this on the top. You go on the little uh, hard drive that should appear on the left, and you search for the volume. Volume uh, 3C, Taxonomic Profiling, Microbiome Tutorial, Results, Metaflan, and then you click on the Metaflan profile.txt. And this hopefully should work. Yes. So we have uh, our uh, sample that was loaded in the, in the Pavian app in green. Um, can you repeat how you open the page, please? Uh, so you go, if you're still in the notebook, you click on this link, fpredvisor.shinyapps.io slash pavian. I can uh, put the link in the chat also. Click on this link. Uh, up. And then you click, once it's open, you click on Browse, and you go uh, all the way to the top to the little hard disk, hard drive icon uh, completely on the left. And you go to Vol, Volume, 3C, Microbiome Tutorial, Results, um, Metaflan Profile.txt. I don't know why is is empty the page in my ca in my case. Uh, it might be that too many people are using the server at the same time. Um, if you can't okay. open it right now, uh, it's not a big deal. You can come back to it later, and uh, and have a look later. You, I'm going to share my screen so you will see exactly what I'm what I'm doing. And it's a relatively really easy interface, a really easy interface to use. Um, so I'll just come back to it later. And once you're using your own computer, I would recommend you uh, either to run it with R or to run it with Docker. This is a free server that uh, Florian Bradweiser is uh, using. 
So it might be limiting the number of uh, simultaneous connections. Um, yeah. So uh, you can click on the results overview tab uh, and it's loading um, the, the table. Uh, you can see the number of uh, row reads. I think uh, here, because a Metaflan is actually uh, not uh, giving us directly the number of reads, it's giving us the proportion of reads, it's showing you 100. We don't actually have only 100 reads in this sample. I downsampled them, but not to this extreme extent. It's showing you it's just the proportion uh, of uh, the total proportion uh, um, of all the, all the, the uh, taxons that it found in the, in the sample. Uh, all of them were classified because uh, because we are only using this uh, proportion. Of course, it adds up to one percent. And out of all of these uh, that we have, eighty-two percent were found by Metaflan as bacterial reads. Uh, you're gonna we're gonna have a, a roundtable about databases. I think tomorrow evening. Uh, but this is an interesting number to keep in mind. Uh, because Metaflan is mostly in its database, is mostly having um, bacterial genomes. So, of course, if you have mostly bacterial genomes, what you're going to uh, end up finding probably is mostly bacterial reads. Um, we can click then on sample. We have this nice uh, Sankey visualization, which uh, shows us the, based on the NCBI taxonomy. Uh, what proportion of different taxons we found. So on the bottom, you have the actually taxonomic level from the kingdom, phylum, family, genus, and species. And we can see that here in this sample, uh, one of the most abandoned species was, for example, Prevotella copri, uh, followed by Metano brevibacter smithi. Uh, and then we can, when we have we can load more than one sample. Here we only have a single one, but we can uh, load a lot more uh, samples in parallel. And here are this table that we can explore at uh, different uh, taxonomic ranks. So for example, it's uh, all the ranks, but if I click on species, I can also order the table uh, by the most abundant one, which is Prevotella copri. And you have a bunch of other options that I would like let you explore by yourself uh, once you're running um, uh, your own um, analysis. So the, the very nice thing about Pavian is that it's working with Metaflan outputs, but it's also working directly out of the box with uh, Kraken outputs. So if you either run uh, Metaflan or Kraken, you can directly um, put the results in Pavian. If you're running other taxonomic profilers, um, Centrifuge also is working out of the box. If you're working with other taxonomic profilers, you might have to do a bit of conversion. But for Metaflan, Centrifuge, and Kraken, it's working out of the box. So you can directly upload the results or run it on your computer and, um, and explore them with Pavian. Uh, another way to look at the results, uh, one that is um, that for sample by sample can be particularly interesting, is um, uh, Krona. So Krona, if you never heard of it, um, is this uh, kind of charts, um, this kind of interactive pie charts with the taxonomical hierarchy that you can uh, then click on and explore. And it's very nice to uh, explore sample by sample what you what they actually contain. So again, uh, we are uh, running bash script. So we have a script that is also av made available by the uh, Metaflan authors called Metaflan to Krona to convert the Metaflan outputs and make them available uh, in the Krona readable uh, format. And so we execute this cell. Uh, the results are already written. And if we go back uh, to, either you go back to Jupyter or you click, uh, if you have already a tab running, click on the results, uh, Krona, krona.html. And here you have them opening. So again, Krona, um, this pie chart, you can then click and uh, focus on only the bacteria, for example, and uh, look for our most abundant species, which I believe was uh, Prevotella, uh, Prevotella copri. And here I'm zoomed out too much. Yeah. Uh, yes.
so it's it's very nice to explore um, the the your sample by sample. When you put it in the publication at the end, I usually I'm not a big fan um, because the the force of this uh, visualization is the interactivity. And uh, and yeah, in the PDF there is not much interactivity. Um, is there any question? <laughs> yes. Mine is, I don't know, maybe it's just like frozen, but mine really can stop responding to like everything. Uh, just refresh the page? Yeah. Oh, so we've done that a few times. <laughs> oh, no, the, uh, the browser in, in this, in the Guacamole browser. Um, yeah, you can go back to the terminal. Uh, maybe, um, Alex, are you, are you there? I'm there. Yeah. Can you, uh, see with Alex in the chat? Uh, it will explain you. I think it's just a matter of restarting the Jupyter server. All right. Um, all right, so we can close this uh, Corona chart. Uh, yeah, so as I was saying, it's very nice to explore the data set, but uh, you will see some publication. You can make a, like a snapshot or a screenshot and then including the publication, but I don't know, it's up to you at the end, but the, the force of it is the interactivity and when you don't have an inter interactivity because it's a PDF, I don't know. Uh, and someone is still has the microphone on. Yeah, okay, good. Up. Uh, so we can go back to our uh, analysis notebook. So we saw, we explore our ancient sample uh, on its own, but the, the, the true and the very interesting part, and let me zoom in again, uh, is actually uh, comparing it with other sample. Uh, so to compare it with other sample, and in this case, um, modern sample, we're going to use a package called um, curated metagenomics data. So it's a very nice package that was uh, published by the Waldron Lab um, a few years ago now. Uh, it's a R package. Uh, they are in version 3.4.2. And it's basically regrouping probably not all, but many, many uh, modern uh, published uh, reference data and they created the, the metadata and made the Metaflan profile uh, available, pre-computed this Metaflan profile for all of these uh, samples. So it's a bit in a way, I mean, okay, we have to give them credit. So ancient Metagem deer, for example, was uh, inspired heavily from uh, this uh, curated metagenomics data. So it's very nice. It's only in R. So again, you have to practice a bit of both. Um, and uh, and we're going to get the results from here. And actually, uh, if you want to know how I retrieve the data, you can go in uh, notebooks, created metagenomics, and you have the R markdown file um, uh, that I use to, to select uh, the, the sample. But you can have a look at it later. Uh, I'm not going to go through it in details. Uh, yeah, I even put the code here. So it's a few lines of R, and what I've done basically is uh, selected um, 100, 200 gut microbiome samples, 100 from a non-Westernized community, so people who don't really live in a Western uh, lifestyle like we do, who don't have so much access to medication and uh, industrialized pre-processed food, and Westernized uh, people like us basically, um, and all for healthy and non-antibiotic um, users. So we have 200 uh, modern samples uh, to compare it to. All right. And yeah, the, I saved them uh, here and the, all the metadata also available um, here if you want to look at it yourself. And this is just, if you're not familiar with the, the NCBI taxonomy, uh, for example, for this, uh, for this fox, uh, 
we have all the different taxonomical uh, level that starts from the domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Uh, and Bettina already introduced you to this uh, this morning. Okay, now comes the exciting part. We're gonna do some Python. Um, yeah. So uh, we're gonna actually import our data in Python. So again, uh, now we're running Python, but it's still the same. To execute a cell, you press Control uh, Enter, or you click on the little uh, select a cell and click on Run. And the first thing that we did, uh, we imported uh, pandas and we gave it an alias PD. So we say um, import the library pandas that we use for data uh, reading and manipulation, and we call it uh, give it the alias PD. So the equivalent of a library in R or require. And then we're going to use the function of pandas called uh, read CSV uh, to read our ancient data. We have um, a bit some different options that we have to use for uh, read CSV because, as we saw earlier, um, our data actually are not uh, super. It's not uh, um, easy to read CSV table uh, at first. Uh, so uh, we give it the path of the file, where to read it. And then we saw at the beginning that there were actually uh, quite a few lines that started with this hash sign. So we tell pandas that these are command lines, that we don't want to read them. Otherwise, it's going to kind of break the table if we don't say that. We saw that it was a tab delimited table. So the sign for uh, tabulation is backslash t. And then the column names are actually the claim name the NCBI taxonomic ID, the relative abundance, and then another column called additional species. We can click on Control Enter. Here, I just reformatted it to make it more readable, but you don't need to reformat it. You can just press Control Enter, and we have it here. And we can look at the first lines of this table with the command dot head, similar to the uh, vocabulary that they use in Bash. Uh, to look at the beginning of a file, it's the command head. Um, and we can see that we have, uh, for the claim name, we have the whole path, the whole taxonomic path or lineage, actually. But you can see it the same way as a path in a, in a computer, except that here it's a taxonomic lineage. You start from the very root, so the kingdom, and then you go uh, deeper and deeper. So for example, here uh, we have the kingdom bacteria with the taxonomic ID number two. Uh, and we saw from Pavian, and we see it here again, that 82% of uh, the reads in our sample are assigned uh, to the uh, kingdom bacteria. And the additional species column is here is, uh, is not useful, not needed. Um, we have this uh, nice function in, um, in, in uh, pandas called sample, uh, where we can look at uh, a few rows random, randomly sampled. Uh, from the data set, to not just look at the beginning. So for example, let's look at five rows. And we can see that uh, here it's a bit more complicated. So for example, uh, here it's truncated because it's too large to display on our screen. But we can see that uh, we have, uh, for example, here we have the phylum actinobacteria. And in the NCBI tax, uh, taxonomic identifier, we also have the lineage as NCBI taxonomic identifier. So it's the kingdom uh, bacteria is taxonomic ID number two, and the phylum is taxonomic ID number this. And 20% of the bacteria uh, belong to the uh, phylum actinobacteria. Of the reads, sorry, belong to the phylum um, actinobacteria. And here's the same for the others, but uh, for now, uh, it's a bit harder to say because it's uh, uh, truncated. Here we have this ancient data. Uh, we looked at it. And um, I was just uh, getting rid of some columns because we're not going to need them for later. Um, and renaming some of the columns so it's the, um, because I'm lazy, so it's less, less characters to type. So we uh, have our ancient data table. We rename the columns that is called NCBI underscore tax underscore ID to tax ID. And we're going to get rid of the column clade name and additional species because we don't really need them for later. So that's what we just did. And uh, this is not going to work uh, if we run it again, but it will work up. 
Uh -huh. oh, this is working. And then we want to uh, look at the sum of the relative abundance um, and see what we get. Uh, if this is a relative abundance, the sum of it should be 100%. And we see that it's 700%, which is very weird. We might be worried at this point. Why do we get 700% of relative abundance? Uh, and this is actually the first question of this tutorial um, um, where you have to uh, uh, do a bit of thinking. Uh, so you can go back to uh, this link, release this content only, and up. Um, basically, um, write why you think that we get um, um, more than 100% uh, of the relative abundance. What, why do you think this is happening? So again, the link is participy uh, slash Be creative. <laughs> it's anonymous anyway. We won't know who answered what. I don't even know if we can see it actually. Rounding up, okay. Any other idea? Because the relative, uh huh, trimming error, rounding up, oh, okay. Uh-huh, someone is, has um, scrolled down a bit more, or already knows metaflan outputs. Build the sum, double counting, needs normalization first, maybe because they're more representative of the same species, I have more than one sample. Okay, so I see you have um, already um, the, the good reflex. You're thinking about um, um, potential, um, valid potential reasons of why we would have a 7%. And actually, we're going to see why we have 700% uh, in a bit. So the suspense, uh, the mystery uh, will remain for a few more minutes. OK, so let's proceed further and try to understand what's happening. But in general, it's, uh, it's just to make you, to, make you to, to, to trigger you. And when you, you look at your data set, always look, explore a bit your data set. And sometimes you might uh, have results that you don't really expect. They can be for a valid reason, or they can be for a problem somewhere in the processing pipeline, either in the wet lab or in the in the dry lab on the computer. And always running some basic summary statistics is kind of a safeguard. It's not the safeguard of everything, but it will help you to detect this kind of small issue that can happen. And later, you can understand uh, why this is happening. And this uh, this we already ran uh, just before. Um, OK. So um, the thing we're going to work, so you can see that, that this table is actually uh, nice. Um, but even when we still had the, the, the lineage that was directly there, it's a bit hard to read, especially um, considering that we have quite a bit of uh, data. So we have actually um, something like, 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 uh, ah, not so much, actually, 67 lines. But let's imagine that we're working with real data. It's way too much for us to, to look at it. And anyway, we're lazy, so we don't want to look at 67 lines. Uh, so we're going to use a library called TaxoPy uh, to kind of make sense of, this, uh, of these lineages. And TaxoPy is using these uh, taxonomic identifiers um, to give us, uh, in return, the name of the taxon the rank of the taxon, and also its lineage. And it might seem a bit more complicated at first to work with taxonomic IDs, but when you're working with data from different sources, from different studies, or uh, coming from uh, sometimes different tools, it's usually the safer bet to work with taxonomic IDs because you can have a lot of in inconsistencies between the species name. They get, as Tina mentioned this morning, they get renamed. You can have typos. Um, you can have, um, for example, sometimes you replace a space with an underscore. 
and usually you will end up uh, more often with issues when you're working directly with the names than when you're working with the tax IDs. So going through the, the, the taxonomic identifiers or the tax ID is usually the safer bet. Just need to do a bit of conversion. And here uh, there is this function. If you're already more familiar with Python, it would make a bit more sense. Otherwise, it's not a crazy function either. We're taking this um, uh, taxonomic ID lineage uh, that we have here as an example. We are separating, uh, we're splitting this, um, this line every time we see uh, this um, pipe character, this vertical um, vertical bar, and we get the last element, uh, which is this one. Once we have the last element, we give it to TaxoPy, and TaxoPy is going to return us uh, a TaxoPy object that uh, we can actually then at the end explore and give us all the information that we need. Um, so we just uh, control enter, control enter. And now we can see that we have the TaxoPy representation. Great, we came back to what we had before, completely useless what we did, right? No, not really. Uh, this is just the representation of the TaxoPy object, uh, but with the next cell, we're actually going to get what we want. So here I'm using a bit of Panda syntax uh, with, the, with the assign function to create three new different columns. The column rank, which is going to tell us the rank of each taxon. The column name, which is going to give us the name of the taxon. And the column lineage, which is going to give us the lineage. So we can execute it and look at what we get ancient data. OK, so now it's much clearer. So we have the tax ID, the relative abundance. Uh, let me zoom out. Up. Come on, come on. Uh, the TaxoPy uh, object and its representation, the rank, the name of the taxon, and then the lineage. All right, so now we are know a bit more, a bit better, and we can see that tax ID number two, for example, is bacteria and not uh, S bacteria. Okay, and S stands for super kingdom. Um, okay. Uh, when we got our modern data from the created metagenomics data package, um, they were actually split by um, split by rank. And actually, the time of this machine is completely off. No, it's not 1233. Yeah, it's 233. Uh, so the modern data are split by ranks. And the one that we chose to uh, work with um, is at the species level. So we actually want to filter this table because here in this table, we have all uh, the different uh, taxonomic ranks. Come on. Ah, not so responsive, the server. OK. So we're going to do that. We're going to use the one of uh, Panda's uh, filtering function called uh, query. And we're going to say, uh, give me. Um, Give me the rows uh, where the value of the column rank is equal to species. So we see ancient species, control enter, and then we can look at what we get. So our ancient species are Prevotella copri, Metano brevibacter smithi, Ruminococcus bromi, Roseboria fesis, Colin, blah, blah, blah. The first five are in the head. So we only get the species now. That's good. Um, we're going to do a bit of renaming again uh, to prepare for um, the analysis uh, that come after. So we select only the column relative abundance and name. We set the index to the column name and then rename relative abundance uh, by the sample name. And that's it, because we're going to merge it with other samples later. You can look at what we get. We get the name. Um, as the index of the data frame, and the column is now the name of the sample. Um, if we would like to work at the phylum level, we can do the same, do the same renaming, and then we have our ancient phylums, which com consist of four different phylums, Firmicutes, Bacteroidetes, Actinobacteria, and Uriarca, however you want to pronounce it. 
Okay, so we had our problem with the 700% relative abundance issue, and I saw the correct answer um, for this problem um, in, the, in the, the suggestions. So if we actually do a group by where we actually split our data frame and look at the relative abundance uh, by each rank, we can actually do it. And we can see that we have something that is much closer um, to the actual uh, answer. So actually, when we did the sum, we did the sum on all the ranks, but you would need to do the relative abundance for each rank because the relative abundance is computed at each rank. So you can see that um, here, for most of the for most of the ranks, you have uh, something that is close to 100%. You only have the one uh, uh, no rank that is very far off uh, because it's the one where it couldn't assign it to anything else or uh, it could be that we have maybe some organisms that don't really fit in the uh, taxonomical concept, like maybe viruses, I'm not sure, um, where it's a bit messed up. We also have the family that is a bit far off, and um, and we might um, think uh, at the end why we, uh, we have this family that is a bit, uh, a bit weird. All right, but it seems much better than 700%, and now we're kind of reassured. Uh, all right, so uh, we load our modern reference that we uh, did before. We can see uh, in our, of the, the modern samples that we uh, got with created metagenomics. Uh, we have 200 modern samples, and also we, pre we process them in the same way that we get only the species as index. And we have the relative abundance in the table. All right. So now comes the time to merge um, our ancient samples with our modern samples in one single table so we can work on them and compare them. And we're going to do it both at the species level and uh, at the phylum level. So the way to do this um, is uh, with a join or a merge. And we're going to merge the table ancient species with the table modern species. We're going to say, use the index uh, for uh, the ancient species, and use the index also for the right table, the modern species. So the index is uh, this part. This is the, the, the common, the join key uh, for the two tables. And we're going to perform an outer join, meaning that um, if one is not present in the other table, they won't get rid of the row. Instead, they're going to put a zero uh, in place. And we do the same for the phylum. We can look at what we get. So we get um, pretty much the same table, except that uh, now the very first column is our um, ancient sample. And of course, um, it can be quite a bit different because we perform an outer join. Uh, finally, we load the metadata that I prepared for you and that tells us um, what a sample is, um, is what. So for example, uh, and we see that this modern sample, uh, we see all the metadata, but the only one that we're really interested in um, is uh, whether it's westernized or non westernized, sorry, which is a column somewhere. It's there, it's just in the middle, we don't see it, but we're going to come to it later. Uh, yeah, actually, right now. Um, so we're going to create a table called group info, and we're going to uh, slightly rename our metadata table uh, to make it more easier to understand for uh, someone looking at our results. So we're going to rename the non-westernized um, metadata column, and we're going to change the values of it. Uh, and if you look in this metadata table, what you would see in the non-westernized column is no or yes. And for me, this is a bit confusing because it's like a double negation, meaning it's a no to non-westernized, then it is westernized. Uh, so I rename them. So in, when it's written no, I write westernized. If it's written yes, then I write non-westernized instead of no and yes. Uh, I transform it to a, a pandas data frame. I set the index to the sample ID. I uh, move the sample ID from the index to a normal column, and I add the information um, um, about our ancient sample um, and say that it's an ancient sample. And this is what it looks at. So we have the sample ID, 
if it's westernized, uh, non-westernized, or if it's our ancient sample. Uh, yes. The next thing that we need to do, uh, once we have our metadata prepared, is to transform our um, our relative abundance table into the tidy um, tidy format. Um, so the first thing, what we do is uh, first add the metadata information uh, to have everything in one single table. So we have our relative abundance table. And the last column is the group. And we have the sample ID as well. Uh, and then we put it in the tidy format uh, with this common, the, the melt common, which at the end gives us something like this. ID file, um, where we now have a column sample ID, uh, the group information, the, fi the phylum, for example, at the phylum level, and the relative abundance column. And then uh, we can do, uh, we can look at the phylum information to look, compare the phylum um, between the ancient and the modern sample. So we're going to compute the mean uh, relative abundance for each phylum in each group. With this command. This is what we get. So, for example, uh, uh, sorry, we just make sure that we have uh, something close to 100%. Uh, so, yeah, that's fine. Then we're going to use the um, Python uh, clone of ggplot, which is called plot9, but actually the function inside plot9 are called ggplot. It's exactly the same syntax as uh, ggplot if you're familiar with it from R. The only difference is that um, you have to put uh, this quotation mark around the variable name, around the column names. And this is the plot that we get. So this is a typical plot that you will see in most um, um, microbiome papers, looking at the comparison of the phylum. And it gives you a broad overview of how similar or dissimilar looking are the samples uh, between each other from the phylum composition. And here we can see. Uh, from the color that the most uh, abundant phylum is the Firmicutes. It's actually better on this screen. And the one that comes after is Bacteroidetes, uh, which already see from Pavian, for example. But now we have a publication uh, ready plot, which we couldn't. It's much nicer to make than to make a screenshot from Pavian. So we have this broad comparison at the phylum level. Um, let's dive into the ecological diversity. But first, is there any questions, uh, whether it's from the people uh, online or from the people in the room? <laughs> what? <laughs> All right, so let's dive in into my favorite part. Uh, here. So um, the ecological diversity. So actually, when we do a microbiome study, uh, we're doing actually uh, a big part is ecology. So most of these methods uh, um, for um, ecological diversity are not specific to the microbiome data. Most of them were actually developed to studies um, uh, macroecological communities like trees, for example. I think the Breakertis method was orig originally developed to compare a different forest, the diversity of different forests. Uh, and But at the end, it's all the same because we're doing ecology, whether we're looking at what microbes are there or what spe species of trees are there. Um, one library, the one library to uh, do this um, in in Python is called uh, Scikit-Bio, um, and we're going to visualize the result also with Plot9 that we saw just before. So we can import Scikit-Bio and then uh, compute uh, different um, uh, metrics. So the first thing that we're going to look is the alpha diversity, which Tina mentioned this morning. Uh, it's the measure of the diversity uh, within a single uh, sample. Up, oh, wait. Come on. 
within uh, not within uh, within each sample. So there are different ways to uh, compute the, the diversity. Tina mentioned uh, Chao Wan and Shannon uh, this morning. Uh, here we're going to compare three different um, um, uh, metrics: the Shannon, the Simpson, and the species richness. They all have um, their uh, different way of being computed, but we can compare them and see uh, how they they compare. So we first comp uh, compute them individually. Uh, so SKBio uh, for scikit bio, uh, the diversity part of this package, we compute the alpha diversity. We say that we on the Shannon metrics. Uh, we uh, give it the all species uh, data frame because now we're working the species level. And then we keep the IDs uh, with the columns. Uh, yes. And the richness is actually um, very, it's like the, probably the most simple of all uh, the metrics. We just look at the number of different species that we have. So I didn't even need to need, ah, sorry. I didn't even need to use a scikit bio uh, diversity, alpha diversity um, package. It's just uh, whether it's present or not. And then I put them all together with this merge uh, function to compare the different metrics. So we can look at it like this, but we can also, um, uh, uh, add the metadata uh, to see if there is a difference uh, between uh, westernized and non-westernized in our ancient sample, put it in a tidy format. And uh, by now, when you hear tidy format, usually what comes next is uh, ggplot or plotmine, and uh, plot it and compare it. So we see uh, in red, we have our ancient sample. In green, we have our non-westernized sample. And in purple, we have our westernized sample with the three different metrics. So the richness, uh, which is the number of species, the Shannon and Simpson index. So here, uh, for the sake of this tutorial, we are only uh, looking at uh, one um, uh, single sample. However, we could look at uh, um, many more. Uh, when is this finishing, actually? It's 3.30? Yeah, OK. Um, so it would be a bit more interesting to look at the diversity of our ancient sample, uh, but we can already compare our one sample to the, to the others, especially that we know, since it's published, that it's actually a well-preserved uh, sample. But that, when you work on your own samples, you don't know yet. Um, so yeah, we can see that uh, um, it's like the the it's here. It seems that on the alpha diversity, it's uh, relatively similar between westernized and non-westernized sample, and um, and our ancient sample seems to be a bit less diverse. There seems to be a bit less diversity in our ancient sample, um, and I think I have um, the second question: Why do you think? Uh, um, this is why do we have um, less diversity in this? Um, why do we observe a lower diversity in this sample? So again, same link. Uh, why don't we? Uh, no, next. Why do we observe a smaller species richness and diversity in our uh, sample? So it's the same link as before. You can just go to the same link and. And free type your answers, and I'm going to show the results. Results. Abstention. <laughs> I'm curious what you mean by abstention. For me, abstention means do not go voting, but maybe there's a different meaning. Degradation issue, incomplete microbiome preservation. OK. Initial number of reads, shitty data that can happen. These ones are already published, uh, and they are very good data. That's why I picked them. Lower coverage, therefore fewer species detected. More sample sampling. If one of the person one of the eight person that uh, chose abstentions could, or nine person that chose abstention could unmute themselves 
and explain what they mean because for me abstention is uh, not going to vote um, but maybe there is a meaning that I'm missing or in the chat oh. I think, Maxim, you're allowed to have abstains from the question and not ah, provide an okay. answer. I so, okay, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> I forgot I allowed this part. Uh, okay, so it's like the, the last uh, French presidential election. Most of the people attended, actually. Okay. Um, that threshold. Okay, let's see. Uh, not inclusive database, uh, uh, fine sequence for which we don't have reference. Mm -hmm. Too much cutting out data, lower coverage, small sample, special sampling, lower coverage, shitty data. Yeah, so um, actually, again, I see uh, the good answer for this particular case uh, among here, among the answers here. But all of them are uh, could be. Uh, could be the reason. This one would be like the biological um, hypothesis. Um, and the others would be more like the simpler ancient diets uh, would be the biological hypothesis. We could test it, but also check the literature to see if we observe this. Uh, and the rest is more like uh, um, um, processing artifacts. So having a database uh, that um, is uh, not inclusive enough, but here we're comparing uh, data that were processed with the same database. So we can already exclude this hypothesis. Uh, the same, uh, yeah, this one would be would work. Maybe in our ancient data, we have two different, two, something too different. Uh, lower coverage, smaller, yeah, exactly. Here, actually, the correct answers is, uh, you have to remember that to make this run fast enough, I um, pre-process the data and only selected 1 million reads. I think the original library was something like three or 70 or 80 million reads, maybe even more. So I reduced the diversity by quite a bit. Um, so that's the, 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 the correct answer. And here, yeah, this is also right. Uh, OK, perfect. So we looked at the diversity of each sample. But now maybe we want to compare uh, the sample based on their content, not just based on their diversity. And to do this, uh, the metric that we're going to use, or what we're going to do is the so-called beta diversity, which uh, Tina also mentioned this morning. And we're going to use the metric that she also introduced this morning, which is the one that is used, let's say, the most often, uh, because it's one of the easiest to compute. Uh, for other metrics, sometimes you need additional data like more taxonomic information for the unifrag distance. But here, we're going to do one of the simpler ones, the Brekertis distance, which gives us um, a distance matrix, so a square distance matrix. Um, and then what we can do is do this PCOA, this principal coordinate uh, analysis. If you never heard of the PCOA, except before this morning in Tina's introduction, it's essentially a PCA, but instead of uh, starting from your data, you first pre-compute a distance matrix, and then uh, you do this so-called singular value decomposition. But it's very, very similar to the, the PCA, the principal, um, principal component analysis. Here, PCOA, principal coordinate. Uh, so we run it. Um, we look at our samples in... Um, our um, principal coordinate space. Uh, so we have uh, we have all of our PCs as columns now, and our samples as rows. And then we can do this typical uh, scree plot that you also do for PCA, looking at the proportion of the variance explain uh, that we uh, visualize with ggplot. So we can see that most of the variance um, is explained. You could look for the elbow. Uh, yeah, here it's, I don't know, um, your guess is as good as mine for uh, the elbow, maybe in the PC7. We're not going to visualize up to PC7. We're going to see one, two, three. And uh, if you're, I don't know what's your background, but if you're doing population um, genetics, you might be familiar with PCA that uh, represents all in all when the two principal components 0.1% of the variance. 
Here it's much more because we don't start from uh, millions of dimensions, from millions of SNPs, but we start from uh, uh, how many columns did we have? From a few hundreds, um, uh, a few hundred species. Uh, so of course the variance is much much higher here in the two two first uh, the two first dimension we capture something like probably twenty five percent thirty percent of the variance. All right, so let's look at the three first one because we're human, so visualizing higher dimensional space is a bit more complicated. Uh, so again, we select only the three first one. Uh, we do some renaming to have a prettier plot at the end. Uh, we add our metadata information uh, to know if it's what's the name of the sample, if it's uh, if it's uh, ancient, non-westernized or westernized. A bit of renaming, uh, uh, removing columns that we're not so interested in, and uh, yeah, and then we plot it with ggplot. Okay, this is what we get for the first two uh, principal components. So in green, we have our non-westernized sample. In purple, we have our westernized sample. And in red, we have our, um, our ancient sample. Um, and this is kind of nice uh, because we know that this sample um, from the archaeological context is coming from this mine from the 18th century. So way before, I mean, way before. It depends on which time scale you're working, but essentially before uh, industrialization and the access to supermarkets and uh, modern medicines. So this is what we would expect. So this is uh, kind of nice to see that this is falling without, um, within the cloud, within the clus cluster in a way. We didn't perform clustering yet, but within the cluster of um, a non-westernized individual. Because from the literature, we know that ancient samples have a microbiome composition that resemble much more the composition of non-westernized modern individuals than our own gut microbiome that consume products from the supermarket. Uh, but don't take my word uh, for it. We can also look at uh, PC1 uh, versus 3. And here again, some samples are relatively close. Uh, and then we can also visualize all the three dimensions together. Uh, it's nice for the interactivity, but uh, it's usually pretty ugly if it's not interactive. Uh, so it's nice for us to look at right now, but in the paper, I don't know. I'm not a big fan of 3D figures in the paper. Could you stop a second? What, what's the difference between those two PCOs now? Um, they look basically the same. Ah, got it. OK, so the question was, what was the difference between uh, the two different plots? In one, we, uh, um, we graphed PC1 versus PC2. And in the second, we uh, graphed uh, PC1 versus PC3. And in the third plot, the interactive one, um, we are now plotting them all together in this 3D plot. So it's nice to explore and to see that our uh, red point is uh, well embedded into the, the ancient, uh, sorry, the non-westernized um, uh, microbiome cluster or, yeah, our group, call it whatever you want. Uh, but yeah, in a publication, I don't know how well this would render. I would put probably put uh, one and two. Maxime, there's a question from the uh, in the chat that you might do a comment on. It's one of your yeah. pet projects. Uh, is it possible to use PCA directly on a distance matrix? Um, so actually, um, statistics is a vast field with a lot of different subdomains and. Uh, uh, in microbial ecology, they call it the PCOA, uh, Principal Coordinate Analysis. But you might have heard of the same concept under the name uh, MDS, multidimensional scaling, uh, which is actually uh, the definition of what you're describing. It's essentially performing this um, uh, singular value decomposition on a distance matrix. Uh, when you do a PCA, you don't start on a distance matrix. You compute this variance covariance matrix and then run the singular value decomposition. Position. It's a uh, technical jargon, but it just means if you start from your data directly, it's a PCA. If you start from a distance, pre-computed distance matrix, it's a PCOA or MDS. Um, and here, because we are working with this uh, distance matrix, uh, we do a PCOA. 
there is a completely, not completely, but um, parallel branch of um, analyzing data that Tina briefly mentioned this morning, where you consider your data as a composition. There is a, always a very vivid um, debate in the field of microbiome. Should you consider your data as compositional or not? I let you read on the background and decide for yourself. There is no uh, agreement um, in the field. But once you treat your data as compositional, your CLR transform them, as Tina introduced this morning, you can run directly a PCA on it. Yeah, that's, yeah, ex that's exactly what Nikolai just wrote in the chat. Exactly. So if you CLR transform them, you can do a PCA. Uh, if you, yeah. Thank you, Nikolai. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe if you come back next year, maybe I will uh, treat everything as compositional and then do a PCA on it. I don't know. It's still not a settled debate. Um, so I had another question. Uh, how do you think this embedding represents how our sample relates to the modern reference samples? It, uh, I'm not going to put it because the answer is um, pretty much the, the same uh, to the previous one. Uh, meaning that even though we can already see it, meaning that uh, with relatively very small data set, uh, it's the general community composition is uh, not changing so much. Even if we subsample by quite a lot here, we subsample, we only took like um, maybe 2% or 3% of the original data set. We could see that uh, the overall community composition is relatively well preserved. And uh, that's very nice because uh, it means that you can run data, uh, your data a lot faster. You can subsample the data by quite a bit. If you have many, many uh, samples to run, you can run, or if you want to do a screening study instead of before spending a lot of money to deeper sequence the sample like they've done here, you can sequence uh, your sample much shallower, for example, only 10 million reads per sample, and still get an overview of uh, what you have in it, at least from a community perspective, not species per species, but just to get a grasp of what the community might look like. And if it's uh, relatively well preserved, looking like a non-westernized um, gut microbiome sample, you don't need a ton of data to do that. Um, I know that, for example, here, um, I think Rafael is our lab technician here. Uh, I think the screening data is 10 million reads, right? Yeah. yeah. So this is uh, one tenth of the data that we do for screening, and it already looks relatively well conserved. It doesn't look completely uh, alone by itself, which uh, would lead us to to think that uh, it's relatively uh, actually the community general community composition is uh, relatively well conserved. But it also still depends. It's not only about the reads, but also how awesome the lab tech was to produce these reads. <laughs> If you didn't hear it, Rafaela was giving uh, self props, but she deserves it. She deserves it. I'm, I'm, I've never, I've never stepped foot in the. I feel that's not true. I went to the lab once uh, when they filmed a documentary, and so you can see me uh, look studying corporate. So not this once, but there was a TV crew that came and filmed us in the lab, and uh, and I'm dressed in the lab as if I have an idea of what I'm doing, but I actually had no idea. So it was my first time in the lab on TV. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so we did this PCOA. Uh, we can also visualize it. Um, we can cluster it and visualize it as a, as a so-called cluster map. Uh, for this, we're going to use another um, um, library in Python for a Python package for a visualization called Seaborn. And uh, yes, and Seaborn, and another library called SciPy, Scientific Python for computing uh, uh, the clustering. Um, and this one, this one line is just uh, we're going to annotate our cluster map and give uh, each different group a specific color that we want to keep from the previous plots. So we specify the, the group um, with the, the color with the associated to each group. We compute it with this cluster map function, and this gives us this. Um, I have to zoom out. Up. That's better. Uh, come on. Yes. 
what so what we see is the the the, the, the break is um index that we gave as an input come on scroll yeah so we have our break uh, that we gave as an input this beta diversity and then we cluster them uh, with the average linkage method um and uh, uh, come on and we have our sample here in red uh, i think the green the green was uh, our non-westernized sample, and the purple or the lila uh, was the westernized sample. And we can see a very similar story uh, that uh, generally it falls well within the cluster of uh, the non-westernized sample. However, some points, as we saw actually um, just before, uh, some westernized samples were relatively close uh, to our uh, ancient individual. Uh, but overall, it falls uh, more within the non-westernized um, non-westernized group, and this is also a typical kind of uh, figure that you would see in microbiome uh, publication uh, to look at this uh, uh, cluster map. Uh, sometimes directly with abundance, or sometimes with the beta diversity. And here we can see we have a big. Uh, the higher, the the more red it is, or the darker it is, uh, rather. Uh, the, the the lower the diversity uh, between samples, so the closer samples to, are together. And here we can see uh, that we have a big block of um, very similar uh, sample. And it's not entirely surprising because uh, you can see that they share a very similar um, similar naming. So we don't display all the sample names. Uh, we can't fit 200 labels on a single axis. So they're randomly subsampled, but you can see in this block, and they share very similar names, so they probably come from the same uh, the same study. Here we observe the same again. So uh, they share a similar name. They have a higher uh, or lower dissimilarity or higher similarity. And here the same again. Okay. So we almost arrive at the end of our tutorial, um, and we can look at uh, what do you do once you have this uh, basic. Uh, microbial ecology um, uh, metrics. So one thing that Tina mentioned uh, this morning is um, the source tracking. And she mentioned uh, two different programs. Uh, usually the one that is used the most is called a source tracker. And it's a, a very, very clever program. And um, it uses um, uh, so-called Gibbs sampling, which is a type of Markov chain Monte Carlo process, um, to attribute uh, to each to each sample the proportion of the the, the different comp what the sample is made of. So if you're if you have an unknown sample and you're wondering, is it more looking like a, like a gut microbiome sample or a, or a skin microbiome sample or an oral microbiome sample or a soil sample? Usually you do this kind of um, analysis to make sure that it's not too contaminated. So the typical um, uh, sources that you would use are soil uh, to make sure that you don't have too many soil microbes in your sample. They, are, they didn't contaminate it too much. So Tina was saying that usually a good proxy for that is the bone uh, of the individual, of, of an individual that was next to your sample. So you have to plan it from uh, the archaeological site, uh, think forward. So uh, it's very nice to, to work hand in hand with the, in the archaeologist if you're not the archaeologist yourself. Another very nice source to have usually is the skin. So modern skin, because we touch our sample with our hands or the the, the the not the technicians, but the, 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 the people manipulating the sample. If you get it from a museum, for example, uh, that can be the, the case that um, you have a lot of skin microbes. So um, this is what you would include. Uh, and then the source the, that you want to identify, so gut microbiome, you would be very happy if you see that it's mostly gut microbiome. So you have to do, we have to do a bit of pre-processing uh, with source tracker uh, because source tracker uh, doesn't work with the relative abundances; uh, it works with the, the sample counts. Uh, so here we're going to multiply the relative abundance uh, by um, random number. Uh, high enough to get uh, uh, count, not, count data. And then a source tracker as a normalizing step um, 
I do air quotes for those who are not looking at me right now, um, where it's basically uh, um, to avoid uh, uh, samples being deeper sequence, having uh, more uh, data is going to basically um, a subsample um, the deeper sequence data to the, the lowest sequence one. So if you have uh, one sample that has only 10,000 reads and one that was 1 million reads, it's going to subsample your um, data until you get only 10,000 randomly subsample reads from the 1 million read uh, one. So for this, we need to get the sample with the lowest uh, depth or species count. We export it to the uh, CSV format. And uh, Source Tracker works nicely with the biome format, the biological observation matrix format. It's an uh, interesting format um, that is, mm, I mean, some people use it a lot. Some people don't use it at all. It, used, it was originally proposed to become a standard for, um, for microbiome data. I wouldn't say that it took, took up, it became a standard, but some tools use it and it's, uh, it's nice. It allows you to uh, to keep metadata and um, and and your actual data uh, together in the same in the same um, file. So we convert it to the biome format. Uh, we prepare our metadata uh, for source tracker, a bunch of pre-processing, and this is what the data looks like. Uh, we have to say uh, whether our sample is a source uh, or it's a sink. The sink is the sample that we want to test. Uh, so here our ancient sample. And then whether uh, the source is non-westernized or westernized here, I simplified it a bit and we have only westernized or non-westernized source. Yes, and then we export it. And this would be the command uh, to run um, source tracker. Um, uh, our source tracker two here in, uh, this example, and we arrive. We do this uh, so-called rarefaction, this uh, subsampling to the lowest sequence uh, sample uh, that we got from uh, this step here. Uh, and you see that uh, you can't really run this. This is actually a markdown cell uh, because this would take forever to run, and it would take so much forever to run that when I prepare this. Um, I run it and then I kind of forgot about it. And then a few, a few days later, uh, Clements that you had uh, uh, for some of you in our uh, session was asking me at lunchtime, hey, Maxime, you have this job that is running since uh, almost a week. Do you, did you forget about it? And I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot about it. This is tracker is still running and it didn't finish. So um, because of this Markov chain Monte Carlo, it can struggle to converge sometimes. And it can take really a long, 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 long time to run. So I actually don't even have the results for that. If you're patient enough, you can run it. But I end up killing it, uh, killing the job. It doesn't scale super well. And also uh, the original source tracker algorithm is now, um, actually let's look, I don't remember which year it was published in. It's, uh, it's from a few years ago. Um, yeah, 2011. And, uh, but it's a very highly cited article, yeah. Uh, so it, let's say it didn't scale, uh, it doesn't scale super well. So there have been other, um, other methods that have been proposed uh, since uh, one of them uh, that I proposed myself. Uh, and more recently, uh, I think last year, there was also this method called FEAST, uh, uh, which I think stands for Fast Expectation Maximization for Microbial Source Tracking that you can also try. Um, at the end, I wouldn't say that it doesn't matter, but as long as um, you explain what you did and justify why you did it, I don't think reviewers will give you too much of a hard time for choosing uh, one method over the other, as long as the method that you're using is um, makes sense for what you're trying to do. Um, yes. And finally, for the next steps, um, that you're, some of this you're going to see uh, over the next days. Uh, some of this may be not, but uh, in your future uh, or current career as uh, uh, ancient microbiome explorers. 
um, you can, I think some of it you already saw actually, um, in, you can, once you have identified which microbes are there, um, you could actually go back and align the reads that you identified or you saw, we have, we had a lot of this, um, methano brevibacter smithy, you could say, Hmm, it seems that we have a lot. I would align my reads against these genomes and look what I get as an alignment. And because we are doing ancient DNA, looking at the damage profile with tools such as sorry, map damage, damage profiler, or pi damage, you could do assembly uh, to see what kind of genome are uh, present in um, an abundance high enough. Uh, if you can assemble them with mega eight metaspates, and I think you're going to talk about this tomorrow. I was at a beginning with Alex and validating this, um, this um, uh, assembled B genomes with tools such as CheckM or Gunk. On Friday, you're going to talk about functional analysis. So not looking at who is there, but looking rather at the functional contents on the gene-based level. Looking at what the functions this uh, metagenome is performing with tools such as Proca or Human. Um, if you have uh, different, uh, if you're in in your uh, in your study, you collected uh, samples from different time uh, periods, for example, or you want to compare even your ancient samples to the modern samples and look at which microbes are more present in the ancient samples compared to one in one group compared to the other group. Uh, you can do this so-called differential abundance. We have a look at this differential abundance method. Uh, I listed some of them here. Uh, there is a very nice review that was published last year um, in, in, this, um, in this article. And what I really like about this review is that they publish all the codes and on, on, on how to do it uh, on their GitHub. So you can literally go and look at uh, what code they used yeah, here. Um, and then uh, do it on your own samples. So uh, it's written in R, but it's really easily translatable in Python. Actually, I run some of this in Python myself, and some of them are also in Python. So for example, how to uh, run a generalized layer model on the CLR transform uh, data. Um, yeah. Uh, and then once you have assembled genome, you can do genotyping and ultimately uh, phylogenomic um, analysis. So yeah, that's kind of the, the introduction to microbial ecology. And if you have uh, more questions, now is the time. Yeah, the whole show effect that you could see between PC2 and PC3. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, there was a lot of discussion going on. Ah, curved. Yes, exactly. Yeah, so this is the, the horseshoe effect um, that we saw. Now uh, we can talk about this quickly. So if you look especially between uh, the PC2 and PC3, you had this uh, so-called horseshoe shape, uh, which usually reflects uh, reflects a gradient um, uh, of completely complete uh, different taxons between uh, one group and the other, or between some samples and the other. So here uh, you have completely different uh, composition in taxons or vastly different composition in taxons uh, uh, in the westernized compared to the non-westernized, uh, which actually, uh, uh, which you can see also here that is they're vastly differing. And actually, uh, Nikolai, who's also, uh, who's also there, uh, wrote a very nice article of why do PCA um, look like this. I think it's uh, on medium, medium PCA. That's the time where I'm, I butcher your name, uh, Nikolai, I'm sorry. Yes, I found you. Why PCA looks triangular? Yeah. And which also explains us uh, why, why we often get this triangular shape. For example, uh, here we also had this uh, so-called triangular shape data. So if you're wondering why uh, this looks like this, I invite you um, 
to read Nicolas' article on Medium and also the bunch of literature that there is on the on the topic. I think someone also posted a, an article in the in the chat. Uh, 